Okay, we're um, close to a couple of minutes past, so um, I, I just wanted to reiterate um, what we've said uh, in the previous. So this is the fourth module uh, of the uh, workshop. We are making each module standalone, so you don't have to have uh, been present at the previous modules in order to under you know understand what's about to be presented. And in fact, this module is going to be uh you know an interesting contrast to uh the previous modules uh where you know directly addressing sort of galaxy um uh, morphology or galaxy finding and sorting um we will go for uh of the order of an hour for the initial discussion five minute break and then uh up to up to an hour and a half for the uh you know for the workshop um if any of you have questions for the speaker, please do make use of the uh, Zoom chat or the Zoom QA. They'll, uh, some of us will be monitoring that. And if if you if if it's clear your question needs to sort of interrupt uh, the you know the speaker, will will alert the speaker that that's happened. In addition, you can use Slack, uh, the link from the main conference page, the Indigo page, the Slack allows you to uh, get any technical issues uh, addressed. Again, there are people who are keeping an eye on, on Slack for anything you need help with, uh, you know, with the mechanics there. And of course, I'll reiterate again, we've posted everything, uh, including the slides uh, and the notebook are in the Google Drive that you will um, uh, uh, access again through the link that's on the main Indigo page. So. Uh, with all of that said, I'll I'll now hand over to uh, uh, to Professor Del Antonio Young Del Antonio, who will be uh, talking to you at this uh, for this module. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, so we're going to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, AI and machine learning applications in astrophysics. Uh, we largely built around galaxy finding and sorting and classification, but you'll see that there are lots of other extensions in ast astrophysics. I want to start with a, a, a sort of brief plan of what I'll say, but also start with a bit of a disclaimer in the sense that, that the projects and ideas I'll be talking about are, come from a series of papers that are not papers that I've written. Um, and so while I know, we'll, I'll try to go through a little bit about the ideas, uh, some of the technical details I'll have to refer you to the actual publications, which are referenced in the in the article in the in the the talk. Um, the other disclaimer I will say is that uh, uses of machine learning and astrophysics are immensely popular. If you just look at papers being published, there is at least one a week or more than one a week. And so I'm going to limit myself. I'm going to limit myself to talking about things in optical astronomy and optical observational cosmology and limit to a few use cases. So do not think that this is the only set of activities in for which AI is, is becoming dominant in astronomy. But I am going to start by talking a little bit about the fact that astronomy has always been advanced by making unexpected discoveries, things that we did not predict then, then having to explain it has changed the way physics has worked. This has been in, particularly important in, in my life because I work on gravitational lensing. And gravitational lensing is something that was theoretically discovered to be possible already by, well, already 1912, but then really in the 1930s, um, but wasn't really discovered until 1979. Uh, when Carswell et al. looking visually at images of quasars discovered a set of two quasars that were very, very close together. In 1980, there was spectroscopy that confirmed that they were the same uh, quasar. And the idea is that this was possible at a time when images that you took on the sky, this was or 1980, you remember, is the epoch of the first use of CCDs in astronomy. So it's really when astronomical images, the way we think of astronomical images started being taken. And you could look at every object and find the weird objects. Of course, they weren't very weird objects because you only looked at a small fraction of the sky, but it was possible to detect things by eye. And similarly, just less than 10 years later, another serendipitous discovery uh, launched me on my career, which was the discovery 
of gravitational lensing in galaxy clusters. To the left, you see the Hubble frontier fields, uh, beautiful image of ABEL 370. ABEL 370 is a galaxy cluster discovered in 1989 because that giant arc at the bottom left was bright enough to discover with, with, um, uh, with the telescopes and the primitive CCDs at the time. And the fields of view were small enough that they were able to detect it. it is a curious part, the original paper did not actually refer to it as a gravitational lens. At the time, people were thinking about tidal disruption of galaxies. And so the first paper called it a potential tidally this distorted galaxy or destroyed galaxy in a, in a galaxy cluster. We have in, in not in this field, but in another galaxy cluster also discovered tidally destroyed galaxies. This is part one from a paper from my uh, ex-graduate student in 2022. What made these discoveries possible uh, was the fact that the data was small. And so one or a small number of researchers could actually look at everything and use our brain to do the classification. So this is not artificial intelligence, but human intelligence. Uh, the next step in this process occurred with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, for which the imaging part took about 10 years and detected 230 million objects as opposed to the few thousand that you would see in a previous CCD image. So of course, 230 million is not is too much to be seen by hand, but it turns out that the next step to, from human intelligence is many human intelligence. And it form, let, this led to the formation of this crowdsource solution, such as the Galaxy Zoo, where amateur observers would look at the images and try to find peculiar and interesting objects. And this actually led to the it's discovery, and there's a little bit of controversy on the word discovery, of this new type of galaxy. Uh, these are galaxies with very, very high star formation rates um, that actually appear green in the images. People didn't think green galaxies were possible, but they're green because they are forming stars at such a high rate that they're emitting most of their light through the line radiation of doubly ionized oxygen, which is a forbidden transition, so you can see it. Uh, through the entire galaxy. This discovery was not something that was anticipated. It changed how we saw the extreme star formation parts. And it was possible because 200 million objects is just on the edge of what you can get a thousand people to, to look at over the course of a year. But of course, optical data sets keep getting bigger. And so the Dark Energy Survey, which ran from 2012 to 2017, got a factor of five more objects. The SSP is a factor of three more objects. Uh, the decals survey has about 30 billion objects, although that's a little bit misleading because some of them are repeats. And that's too many to ever look at. And that means that you're now transitioned from human intelligence into what artificial intelligence. There's a, another revolution about to happen. The Rubin Observatory is in final stages of construction, and it will conduct what is now called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. They've kept the acronym LSST and just changed what it meant. Um, and this is a telescope that has added an extra wrinkle into the problem, which is that they're actually interested in things that change in the sky. And they're taking four exposures per minute, uh, which means that they actually need to figure out all the millions of objects within 30 seconds and figure out what's interesting. And this is added to an incredibly complex computational problem. So the sky is changing. That, that's meant to uh, completely uh, more complicated uh, solutions. Furthermore, the simulations that are needed to actually verify and model uh, what we see in the sky will also be equally large. In fact, in order to figure out ensemble properties, particularly on the largest scales, we will need hundreds of simulations, each roughly as large as the data. And again, looking for peculiarities in those is going to be a huge computational challenge. So that's the emphasis that I'm going to take. I'm going to talk about machine learning in big surveys. And it's affected all changed parts of the surveys, which I can't cover in the talk. So my plan is to talk about five vignettes. The first of which actually has nothing at all to do with galaxies, but is like an area where machine learning has already taken over and dominated the field so that all the algorithms that are uh, employed are now machine learning algorithms. And then we'll talk about the galaxy detection and classification and determining galaxy distances, 
which will be the topic of the, the workshop. We'll do a simplified version of a galaxy distance measurement, and then talk about a few applications and more into cosmology. So cosmic ray removal. Um, as you've heard in the last couple of days, if you attended the other sessions, uh, silicon is wonderful for detecting high energy particles. Uh, LHC has lots and lots of silicon detectors. Um, but of course, we're not interested in detecting high energy particles. So for us, cosmic rays and the signal of high energy particles is, is a nuisance. And the question is, how do you remove it? So for a long time, we used the fact that cosmic rays are somewhat smaller than stars, simply because the particle is traveling through the atmosphere and then hitting the detector. And so the signals are sharper. And so what we do is actually create a, a smooth version of the image, subtract the two, look for large gradients. Um, but in fact, once you have millions of objects, this is a place where machine learning is completely, obviously, a simple use. You have many, many cosmic rays. You have multiple images of the same sky, some with cosmic rays, some with not. It is actually very easy to train a network to find things easy. It is There are many implementations of networks that train cosmic rays. And even if the training is slow, the application of that network is so much faster than convolving an image and subtracting it that the this the cosmic ray removal uh, packages such as DeepCR, uh, which was the first of those, um, which has then now gotten a, uh, an augmentation, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, the training of these is is somewhat slow, but the application is factors of a hundred faster, and so. Uh, uh, that's changed how we do cosmic ray removal, it, even to the point where uh, the Rubin Observatory was considering using pairs of observations to make sure that they could cosmic ray subtract. But now it's so efficient to flag the cosmic rays on single exposures that they plan on, on doing single 30-second uh, exposures instead of two 15-second exposures. That saves them 10% on readout time which sounds like a little bit, but over 10 years, 10% 10 of little year of, of 10 years is one year. So it saves them a year of observing or alternatively gives them a year extra depth. The original methods for this were very simple uh, neural networks that were basically trained to look for features. But um, one of the things that's interesting is that most of the pixels in these images don't have cosmic rays, luckily, right? If you, they had mostly, then we'd be losing more than half the image. And so the most recent advances use these things called attention gates, which uh, when you feed the image in during the training, learns to pay more attention to certain parts of the image where, where things are more interesting between the pairs of images. And that speeds up the training quite significantly because you're no longer training it to recognize uh, only, uh, you know, spend most of your time training on things that are the same. Okay, that's an application where, where uh, uh, machine learning is the state of the art. Now let's move to, to applications where machine learning is becoming the state of the art, but is not yet the state of the art, or is not yet universally accepted. Which is, you take an astronomical image, you want to know, can you detect what's in the astronomical image? And the basic uh, mechanistic tradition of, of this dates all the way back to the 1990s, and it's basically a peak finding algorithm where you look at an image, you have a program identify all the highest points in the image, regions of local maximum, find simply connected regions all above some threshold, and uh, call that an initial image. And the problem with that is, is that probably visible most obviously in the top right of this image, there are a bunch of things which are clearly two objects which have been loaded in uh, where the program has decided it's a single object. And that means that there's a problem of not just of detecting peaks, which can be done without a machine learning algorithm, but of deblending peaks. And the basic idea behind deblending is that you look for local maxima within your selected object and try to decide if those are big or small. And the problem with this is that the thresholds that you set for splitting an object, right? You, you, section at intensity levels decide the multiplicity of an image is that the thresholds are arbitrary. And it turns out that, that for a single threshold choice, there is no way to take both a big galaxy with lots of spiral arms and lots of structure and keep it a single object 
and to split off the small objects from it. And so you have to make a choice. Um, as a practical matter, often in research, we, we actually produce two catalogs, one a catalog of big objects and one a catalog of small objects. But that's an inefficiency that machine learning can change. So one of the things people have started looking at are uh, problems using variational methods. So the, one of the most uh, advanced of those is, is Liouadal's StarNet. Starnet is a somewhat specified, uh, specific uh, solving solving a somewhat specific problem. It's trying to separate out multiple stars in a globular cluster in a cluster of stars. Um, and the idea is that that what they do is they use the image itself, break up the image itself, and create uh, different uh, layers for the objects, and then um, using uh, the distance between the predicted object and the real object, using that divergence to make the distributions of objects statistically similar. And one of the nice things about this is that this neural network allows you to change the, uh, the uh, multiplicity of the objects. So you typically set your tiling so that you have only a few objects, and it tries to decide if it's only one or two objects. This can be done. Uh, because stars are all roughly the same shape in the universe. And so you don't have the extra level of complexity of trying to separate out, out things that are different. A pattern with two stars is actually quite different, and they actually go through tests to figure out what the separation between stars they can make. In, in this particular case, they do also have a real-world example to test their evaluation. The performance, the training is done on ground-based data, and the performance is valued in a much higher resolution data where the blending uh, is much less and they can figure out have they split the two objects or not. The problem is that we know what stars look like, but every galaxy is different. So the idea is that you can't use a presupposed shape. And so the question is, can you do the same detection and flux measurement on galaxies? This is still a complete, a, a, not completely solved problems. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the solution so far. But in a few cases, we can actually make significant progress. For example, in strongland systems, uh, where you have some prior as to the distribution of the shapes of the lensing, because you know there's a physical association between the objects, you can actually use uh, multiple deep learning approaches into a pipeline. So the idea is that here, you use uh, a deep learning pipeline to look for objects that are distorted so that you find the strong lensing part. Then you use uh, another pipeline. Once you've found the objects, you don't no longer have the multiplicity problem and you try to blend the objects again with a trained network. And so they call this a, a multiple deep lensing or deep uh, learning pipeline. But basically what it is is a sequential set of neural networks, each of which is aimed at looking at one particular aspect. Of the, of the problem. Another approach of this is to use variational autoencoders. Uh, so in variational autoencoders, you can train on a sample and then use the, that, that training to decode uh, a sample. And the advantage here is that you can train uh, on a distribution of galaxies that are singles and use the patterns of singles to try to, to find the effective pattern of, of, of doubles. Um, so here, the, the plan is to use two variational encoders, one to denoise the data and come up with a model. The other is to use the, the set of trained models on the data. Here, the, the work of Arcelin et al. has been very successful in reproducing the shapes of the brighter galaxy. And in, in fact, the goal explicitly is not to reproduce the entire scene of the sky but to extract the contamination of distant of smaller galaxies onto the bigger galaxy so you can recover the shape of the bigger galaxy. I notice there's a question in the question, is it something I can wait? Yes. OK. So that's detection of the galaxies. And, and as I said, detection is not a solved problem. Oh, yeah, back to this sorry, at the end. I was end. talking to the mute. It was, a, it was asking just whether it could be extended to cover, cover Starlink satellite contamination. 
Streaks. Oh, Starlink satellite contamination is an interesting problem. So once the Starlinks are, Starlinks are not are de fully deployed, um, they uh, are much much brighter than the typical galaxies you will detect, and so typically they will uh, come close to saturating the detectors, uh, and because they are extended objects they will have a characteristic shape which is different from that of stars. So they are, the expectation is that it won't be a machine learning algorithm. It will be uh, a, 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 they will be separated in size magnitude, basically. They'll, they'll not look like any real star. Yeah, as far as I know, no one has come up with a machine learning, it, because, it's, because there's a non-machine learning algorithm that will separate them, no one has tried to come up with a machine learning algorithm for Starlinks. Um, there is a lot of, of issue uh, with uh, trying to remove slow moving asteroids uh, because slow moving asteroids unfortunately look much more like galaxies. Uh, and that is an is an ongoing uh, uh, project. There, the goal, and I guess I'll talk about it towards the end. There's a uh, people who are doing image differencing are interested in in trying to to train uh, on sets of known asteroids to try to have it not even before it does the difference, basically find, say, this is not worth doing an image difference on, it's an asteroid. Um, so, so beyond detection, and as I said, detection is not a solved problem, and I, we'll come back to it at the very end of, of this talk. Um, there's another large uh, swath of machine learning applications based on galaxy classification. So galaxy classification is, is something that, that has a very old history, and uh, basically, the idea is that if you look at images of galaxies, you can broadly classify them into multiple classes. So in the very simplest case, you can classify them on, do they seem to have complex structure or are they simple blobs? Simple blobs are uh, ellipticals or disk but no arm galaxies, so S0 galaxies, and spirals have more or less structure. This is, as I said, an, an old subject, but one that is still current. And the reason that it's still current is it turns out the morphology of galaxy tells you lots of things about the galaxy that you would have a hard time, that you, if you can just recognize the image, uh, you don't have to go out and, and, and measure in a much more complicated way. So it turns out the morphology of a galaxy correlates very strongly with the star formation uh, properties with its environment. So there's this property where the galaxies that are elliptical are much in much denser regions. So you can use morphologically elliptical galaxies to look like a distance. The merger history, so have there been giant collisions, the size, the luminosity, what have you. All of those things come out if you can recognize the shape of a galaxy. Now, when there were only a few, when you're looking at a galaxy one at a time, a human could do this. This is a, a place where training a machine learning algorithm to do classification is, uh, is still a relevant problem. So an example of this is, is Martin et al. 2019 using an unsupervised machine learning scheme to galaxies. And the idea is that they've abstracted the way the detection problem, they start with a catalog of detected galaxies and the images. So they're not gonna do the detection and the blending problem, but the idea is that then group the sets of images into visually similar objects. So have a, a, a unsupervised machine learning uh, network, take the images and decide by itself what makes the images similar. Um, the problem of how many groups is solved by using a, 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 um, a neural uh, gas system. So a neural gas system is, is one in which uh, the number of of classes has a penalty associated with it, but the fitting of classes also, the, the closeness of the pairs also has a, 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 a win fun, or it's a, lo a loss function to it. So the, the more tightly separated different groups you can make, the better you are. But if you start making groups that are too widely separated from each other, it will stop. And so the idea is to, to then create this hierarchical clustering. And what they find is that when they do this, they can, the main separations in are morphological separations. They've given them the images. And so you naturally find the feature vector that separates elliptical galaxies from spirals. It's like actually a very uh, uh, neat application of this. 
And the result is that they already get to physical results. They can classify things that look like spirals and then look at their physical properties and show that they recover the same physical correlations that you do with a hand-selected sample. So they can find, for example, that the star formation rate for spiral galaxies really is higher than the star operation rate for the classified elliptical galaxies. And as a side note, they also managed to show that uh, the galaxies that are spirals and the galaxies ellipticals also look different from the stars. Stars are actually fairly simple black bodies. And so they occupy in terms of, of their color, a very narrow range or relatively narrow range. And so the galaxies, you can separate out galaxies from stars even without knowing what's this galaxy and what's the star based on, even without the morphology. Oops, sorry. There is of course an alternate way of doing this. Again, as I pointed out, if you look through the literature, every one of these subjects has like 10 different implementations, each with a different model. The uh, alternate way that I found uh, interesting was, was this active learning method of Walmsley et al, which basically uses the galaxy zoo team uh, in conjunction with the CNN. And the basic idea is that, that you have the CNN classify things and the things that are most uncertain then get passed to a human to help train the CNN. And so the idea is you classify the most informative from a training point of view, the objects, which then help the classifier and iteratively they get better and better classifiers. So the advantage of this is it allows the training to improve without a very large sample of well-classified galaxies, because the ones that are easy to classify, you don't bother reclassifying. You spend your time uh, improving the classification of the ones that are, uh, that are unclassified. And they found that they, in this way, they could improve uh, the classification. And when tested on high confidence galaxies, they would get near perfect uh, separation. Okay, we've talked about detecting galaxies, we've talked about uh, deblending them, we've talked about classifying them. There's one other property of galaxies that is extremely important and one that we'll uh, work on more in the workshop, which is the photometric redshift problem. So the basic idea is that when you take a picture of the sky, it is intrinsically a two-dimensional picture. But the distance and I will use distance and redshift interchangeably. The expansion of the universe changes the wavelengths of light as a function of their distance and as a function of their look back time. Um, because we build up the 3D structure and you can allow us to see what the conditions were like in earlier in the time. The way you measure the distance precisely is through spectroscopy. So in a spectros in spectroscopy, you break the light up into all the constituent wavelengths. And since galaxies are made of stars and gas, the, emis the emission and absorption of the galaxies and gas is just the sum of the emission and absorption of the stars and gas in them. And you can measure the distance directly from the wavelengths of those emission and absorption lines. And that provides a very, very precise, precise to a part in 10,000 or around a part in 10,000 distance estimate. However, obtaining a spectrum is really expensive. Uh, even the best multi-object spectrographs can get redshifts of a few thousand objects at a time. But an image will contain a million objects at a time. And so there's a factor of a thousand mismatch between the things you can get images from and the things you get spectra from. And as a result, people have developed this, what's called uh, photometric redshifts. And the idea behind photometric redshifts is you use not the lines themselves, but the shape of the spectrum. The shape of the spectrum of a galaxy is typically dominated by the population of stars. And for different populations of stars, you have slightly different shapes, but each of those shapes then as a function of redshift evolves differently. And so this procedure basically, uh, before machine learning was applied to it, basically involved taking template spectra and matching the observed, producing color images from those spectra and matching the, the resultant colors to the spectrum. That can be done in a probabilistic way. So this is uh, the process of Bayesian probabilistic redshifts. 
or using real spectral libraries and spanning the relative redshift range and just finding which spectral library matched your, uh, your data best. But to some extent, and you know, you can do reasonably well in this. This is an uh, example from the Lavox survey, which I and my graduate students and ex-graduate students have been working on. And you know, for, for the thousand or so galaxies for which we have spectroscopic redshifts, you can get an answer to good to about 5%. Remember, 5% is much worse than a factor in a, of, a, of one in 10,000, but you do it for every object and not just one every thousand objects. But on the other hand, photometric redshifts and machine learning are a match almost made in heaven. The reason for that is that it's got a relatively simple data vector, although I will, some of the techniques I'll talk about in a few minutes ago uh, from now actually use much more complicated data sets. It has an almost noiseless truth table, the spectroscopic redshift. And so if you look in the literature, virtually every machine learning algorithm has been turned into them. In fact, I, I did this exercise yesterday. I went through the last month's worth of, uh, no, last week's worth of uh, archive articles, so uh, published articles. And even in the last week, there were two separate photometric redshift machine learning papers. So two a week means that there are 100 different papers being published a year on this. Um, the particular one I'm using is, is from Hengis et al., which compared different networks. And so I thought, thought that was an interesting one. But the basic idea is uh, that given that data vector and you train on the things that have redshifts and then you apply to other redshifts. And that can be done with simple CNNs or it can be done with these mixed input CNNs where mixed input CNNs use, uh, use uh, image pixels uh, as the extra feature. Uh, so you train on both the colors and the and the features, and and you weight separately on the on the two. Whilst PhotoZs give you a few percent accuracy, you can uh, you can get to much higher accuracy with uh, with photometric redshifts, where you turn the four percent uncertainties. Oh, somehow I inter. Yeah, you get you get to redshifts of of uh, uncertainties of less than three percent. Now, I'm not interested in individual galaxies. Oh, individual galaxies are wonderful, but uh, I'm interested in galaxy clusters. And galaxy clusters do have one advantage over galaxies, uh, individual galaxies. Because of the morphology density relations, galaxy clusters have many elliptical galaxies. And elliptical galaxies break one of the degeneracies in photometric redshifts because they don't have much star formation. Because they don't have much star formation, the galaxies almost all look the same. If you compare, so what I'm plotting on the left is the difference in magnitudes, which is like a ratio of fluxes as a function of flux. You can see that all the, a lot of the galaxies in the cluster lie along a very tightly clustered sequence called the red sequence. And that means that we can select the objects based on their sequence. Now the color of the sequence since the spectrum is the same for every galaxy and the galaxies, the looking back in time, you always are only seeing old stars, means that the evolution in their color tells you the redshift. And so finding a concentration of galaxies in position color space indicates a cluster and its redshift. And this is the principle behind the deterministic algorithm called RedMapper, which is a very popular way of discovering galaxy clusters. But in, it turns out that, again, if you use machine learning, you can do better than RedMapper at finding clusters. So, for example, Chan et al. use the Z-sequence uh, technique where they take uh, in color and uh, position space, construct k-nearest neighbor groupings, and then create a bootstrap sample of those k-nearest neighbors and average those with the principle that uh, the average of those resamples is always more stable than one. And then they create an average prediction to get the redshift accuracy down to 1%. So this is, again, 30 times worse than spectroscopy, but it is 1,000 times cheaper in observing time. And so it is, from a cosmological point of view, a tremendous win. A more recent version, Grishin et al., in fact, I, don't, I think this exists only in preprint uh, form, so it hasn't yet uh, gone through all the refereeing is instead of using RedMapper itself to find the clusters or catalog colors of the galaxies the way uh, the previous uh, paper used, 
try to find the clusters directly by trading on the images using YOLO, which is a, a machine uh, vision uh, trained algorithm. And the basic idea here is you feed it a bunch of images and you tell it uh, uh, there are clusters here. And then you use those training to apply to a complete survey where you don't know where the clusters are. And you ask it to find the clusters. And what you find is that, that compared to uh, RedMapper, YOLO does very well at finding the red mapper clusters. There's in fact only one place where it really fails, and that is very close. And the reason for that is, is actually quite simple. The algorithm looks at the image, and if the galaxies are too far apart because you're too close, and so the angular size is too big, it doesn't group them together. as And so it detects them as individual concentrations rather than a single one. But for most other distances, it actually does well, as a bonus, applied onto images, they actually found uh, galaxy clusters that RedMapper had not. And this is one of the features that actually interests me, and we'll talk about it at the, the very end of this uh, presentation. Uh, it turns out that once you make a catalog of galaxies, the things that were too faint for you to detect are not in the catalog by definition, but they're still in the image. And so training on YOLO, uh, YOLO discovered that that an increased background due to undetected objects was a good indicator, or better, a good indicator of a galaxy cluster. And it was able to find galaxy clusters that were not uh, rich enough for, uh, or, or were were too confused for um, for the catalog based uh, finders. And this gives us some promise that that actually image based machine learning techniques will will start dominating over catalog-based machine learning techniques. OK, let's go one step further in abstraction. Uh, what we're actually interested in is the distribution of dark matter in the universe, or distribution of, of, uh, of mass in the universe. And it turns out you can use machine learning on uh, to, to infer the distribution of density. Here, the paper by Park et al. Uh, use this sort of specialized version of this, where they're using a, a Bayesian graph neural network to, which is uh, to to find the distribution of magnification. So basically, using the number of galaxies and their clumping and their brightnesses to infer the distribution of of uh, amplification of the signal due to gravitational lensing, which is a measure of the mass. In this particular application, they were interested in the distribution because they're interested in how much signal is being changed when you look at lens quasars from the external uh, dark matter distribution that isn't part of the of the lens of the two quasars, but is just the large scale structure along the line of sight. And they were able to use a graph neural network to to predict that that value and add that into their modeling of the uh, the masses and therefore the time delays between the quasars. In another cosmological context, you can use neural networks to determine uh, when you look at objects, what is the optimal redshift bin distribution? So here I, I have to explain a little bit of the physics behind that. So bear with me for three minutes. Um, when you look at the distribution of galaxies, they are not randomly distributed. They have a correlation function. And so if you plot their distribution on the sky, they have what's known as a two-point correlation function, which is the excess probability over random of finding a galaxy as a function of distance. When you look at the dark matter distribution, the gravitational lensing, it also correlates because structure correlates. These are both due to the fact that gravity is the thing that brings things together. But there's a third correlation, and that correlation is the presence of galaxies with the distortion of the galaxies behind those galaxies, so from one bin to the other because it is the galaxies in, in, that are in the foreground that are causing the lensing of the background galaxies. So calculating the sum of those three correlations the, 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 is a better cosmological measure than any one of the two. The problem is that when you're doing those cross bins, you need to know what redshift each object is. And when you're averaging the correlation functions, what you really need to know is what bin the object is in. And this turns out to be a different photometric redshift problem than getting the redshift accurately. Because as long as you get the object in the right bin, you're fine. You don't actually uh, need the, the redshift to be accurate within the bin. 
Um, and that turns out to call for a very different loss function than the photometric redshift training regime. So even though they use a very similar network, they actually tried different uh, neural network uh, weightings to try to figure out which one would give you the best cosmological constraints. Okay, you talked at the beginning about LSST having that 30 second requirement for proc distancing. One of the big problems when you have uh, a difference in it, uh, looking for different things is that you need to be able to scale shift and subtract an image and then detect things that change. This works, but comes at a huge computational cost because if you have to take an image that has a million objects, compare those million objects to the objects and subtract it, it turns out that a better way would be to still take the reference image and new image, but use the time before you do the image difference to train a CNN to tell you if there's a difference. I you sorry, I, I realized that in my write-up I said if there's an image, it's a difference. Um, the idea is that that training a CNN is of course of course slow, but you can do that offline because you have the reference images and you have templates of what the things that change are. Once you've trained it, you no longer have to do the scaling and imaging. The CNN knows what's changed between the two images. And that is much, much faster than actually doing image differencing on the fly. At the moment, it is still less efficient. It only gets to about 90% efficiency compared to 95% for difference imaging based on, on data from the Dark Energy Survey. But this is almost certainly the future of, of source detection. As the number of objects gets bigger, doing the full image convolution and difference thing that you need to subtract the two images becomes computationally too expensive. And you need something like this to do the detection. OK, let me talk about the most ambitious uh, scheme today before we talk about the end one. In 2020, uh, Hausen and Robertson proposed a program called Morpheus which actually tries to do detection to blending and classification on the images at a set. And the basic idea is that it's, it's kind of like the pipeline of, of machine learning. It has a bunch of networks that do the detection of objects, that same type of segmentation, and then tries to do the segmentation into blending, again, training a network and uh, uh, markers set by the, the detection net to it. And then for each pixel in the image, it treats each pixel in the image as an input to a new, another uh, network that classifies the color in that pixel as elliptical-like or spiral-like. And so the idea is that you start from an image like this, and it will produce a probability for each one, uh, a score ranking for each type of, of color. And you can see that. Uh, the spiral galaxy is mostly classified as mostly disk, but the core of the spiral galaxy it actually correctly classifies as having some weight of spherical. It turns out to do lots of weird things at the edges, so it's still not uh, the best solution. But the idea is if you train it on a set, on an on augmented set of, of real galaxies, it starts approximating what the classification uh, that you would do uh, separately without having to pre-detect objects. So it, it tries to combine the effect of a bunch of, of, of work. Um, this is one that, that will continue to be developed on, I suspect, in the next few years. And new ideas, in, in particularly in image uh, uh, classification, will be very useful. Again, places where the signal noise is very high, where the galaxy is easy to determine, it works well. And as you can see, the outer edges are a mixture of compact and other things where it didn't really know what to do with the, with the galaxies on the outside. OK, so I want to highlight that this is only scratching the surface. Uh, there are more than 30 papers a week using machine learning techniques in astronomy. So again, there was one, two a week in, in photometric redshift. There's a whole bunch doing other things. And so there are lots of, of areas where uh, machine learning is really starting to make a complete change. And this is a good thing. It's a highlight of the fact that there are many problems left to solve. Many of you, maybe you will solve them. And one of the problems that I'm particularly interested in solving that uh, is uh, to go beyond the YOLO step of finding there is a cluster to ask, if I look at this image, how much dark matter is in this image? 
in principle, all of the information is in the image and not all of the information is in the object catalogs. What we currently do is the mechanistic system of creating an object catalog and then interpreting the, the, the lensing signal based on an algorithm that tries to match the pattern of distortion or pattern of ellipticities of the galaxies to a, a given mass estimate. But in doing so, we neglect all the objects that are too faint to make it into galaxies, all of which are still distorted. And we also neglect what's called the intercluster light, which is the light from stars that are stripped from the galaxies. That light is distributed exactly like the dark matter and provides another indicator of what the dark matter distribution is, but it is too faint for us to make into individual catalogs. And so it's currently being dropped on the floor. This is the challenge for the next generation of machine learning algorithms and to go beyond simple detection to actually try to make a measurement. Uh, we're working on this, uh, trying both to, to train a network to, to create simulated images. And one of the big issues is that, that the simulations never capture all of the reality of real images. And so we're working on what's called source injection, where we try to put galaxies where we know the distortion we've applied to the galaxies into the images, uh, disturbing the noise as little as possible so that when you run your detection pipeline, you can recover, do you see the shape that you put in? But here is our mechanistic dark matter model. What I'm hoping is in five years or so, maybe even less, to have a machine learning algorithm that will produce a map that's even better than this. All right, thank you for attending. Uh, let me ask for questions now, and then we'll take a break before we move on to the workshop aspect. So please feel free to use the um, either the Q and A or the um, or the meeting chat input. If there aren't questions, I would, would suggest it's 2.48. Should we take a 10 minute break and meet up again at three? Well, I think it's all right to start five minutes earlier. Okay, so. we'll, we'll take a five minute break. I will also need a five minute break, break, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we'll, well, if, would you prefer a 10 minute break? No, five I, is five is fine. So we'll call it a five minute break. So five minutes to the top of the hour. Um, and just to remind people, go to your, you know, go to the Google, um, shared uh, disk, and it, you know, in this case, we're galaxy finding and sorting. So if you go into the galaxy finding and sorting directory on the Google disk, uh, the, the worked examples is go is going to be sourced in there. So you might want to, um, you know, make sure that you're ready to uh, follow along there. Although I'm 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 sure Tim will be giving us um, uh, you know instructions to make sure people are on top of that. Anyway, but yes, so we're now we're now officially on break for five minutes till five, we'll meet back again at five minutes to the hour. Okay. We'll just give people another minute to uh, collect this up. And then Tim, are you uh, sorry, Jan, is are you handing over to Tim or you're starting? I'm going to unmute myself and then start myself. And then uh, I think we'll do this as a joint exercise where I'll talk about the physics and Tim will talk about the code as we move, go through it. Tim, are you, are you good with your connection? Uh, I think I am. Good. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to launch the, the, the collab and uh, share that now. Okay, so if anybody has uh, support, uh, questions, uh, shoot across over to the Slack. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to hand it over to um, to Mondas and um, Professor Jan Del Antonio for the um, workbook part of the presentation. Thank you again. So I, I should introduce the participants in this. I, so um, I, I'm Jan Del Antonio. You've met me before. Um, Tim Launders is uh, is a senior at, at, at Brown. He he helped write. He wrote uh, the code, and Sean Dubay is a postdoc at the CFPU, and helped uh, debug and especially work on on a lot of the con file connection parts. So the uh, three of us are online. We will interchange. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing, 
Tim will talk a little bit about how we're doing it. And as you work through it, um, and then Sean will be available to help if there are issues uh, and MC part of it. Um, so what I'd uh, like to start with is, is a brief recap. So what we're trying to do is measure galaxy distances. So this presupposes that we've detected the galaxies and we're doing a simplified version of the problem because the training can actually get quite long if you're training on a photometric redshift classifier. So in particular, this is an exercise to, to test out a very simple neural network classifier where you can actually set some of the, the parameters, uh, particularly the training parameters that selects galaxies to try to figure out which ones are per, part of the galaxy clusters. So instead of separating the, uh, the galaxies and redshift bins, today we're actually trying to do, uh, you know, is it in the galaxy cluster and is it not? And that turns out to be a very useful physical problem because the galaxies that are in the cluster, then you can target to measure the velocities, to measure the star formation rates, to figure out the population in a cluster. So in particular, in this particular exercise, the galaxies will not be classified by redshift, but will be near, far, and uncertain. At this point, uh, Tim, is there anything that you want to add? If not, I'll talk so talk about what we have. So remember, to get the distances, you measure the redshift. So here's an example for the galaxy. The data vector we have are the images in the different filters and their brightness in a different filter. And we'll be using the brightnesses in the different filters. But um, the particular uh, distances we have for our training set is we actually have the photometric redshift or the spectroscopic redshift. And you can see for this galaxy, the distance is determined uniquely by the pattern of silicon, hydrogen, oxygen, sodium, magnesium, and calcium in the line in the galaxy. And only for a single redshift does do all the lines lined up. And so we know the redshift of this galaxy exactly. So the first part of this is 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 just a simple import you can package it. I, should point out that rather than using a pre-built neural network, this program actually builds its own network or uh, network object, uh, neural network object. Um, so Tim, uh, I'm just going to click on import packages. Ask you all to import your packages. Uh, warning: the notebook is not authored by Google. I think we're okay. Okay, that sh hopefully has worked for most of you because that's just importing random objects. Again, if you have issues in running the notebook, uh, please uh, put a post on the Slack. Okay, Tim, do you wanna talk about the neural network class? Yeah, of course. So um, all of the functionality for the neural network is wrapped up in this class object. So I've used a lot of, um, principles from object-oriented programming uh, in implementing this neural network. So for that, we create this class, which um, will contain all of the parameters that the network uses to determine whether or not a galaxy is you know, near or far. So you can uh, have a look through here if you'd like. Um, it just has a bunch of functions that uh, take, it basically takes the 10 input uh, data points. I don't think we've mentioned this yet. So each galaxy has um, brightnesses in five different bands. And so the difference between all those bands is what goes into the network. So it takes those 10 um, values and then gives you a decision um, from that. And then we also have uh, the trainer class below that. So the network yeah. class just makes the decision. So yeah, let me just hit click. click. It's very quick. Again, you can click up. It'll run in no time. Okay, we're we're on trainer class. Yeah. So this uh, takes in it's an it's another class from object oriented programming. This takes in the training data set along with the corresponding answers, um, as well as the network object, and um, actually trains the network. So the network starts with having random um, parameters, and then this will go through and um, calculate the loss function um, for the data set and um, adjust the parameters to minimize that loss function. This is actually an interesting point. We 
made the choice of giving the network no information about what the relevant colors are. And you'll see this when it starts displaying the training results, that the result of this, of giving it no information, is that the network doesn't start off by knowing anything about what galaxies should look like. So it's very different from the physics of, say, BPZ, where you have a template and you know what the galaxies look like and you, you try to match to those. Here, it's trying to figure it out based only on uh, the existing values. And so you'll see that, that the training doesn't start off particularly efficiently because the existing combinations of differences aren't a particularly useful data vector. And it's only a linear combination of those that's a useful data vector, which we'll find later on in the in the fitting. Okay, I'm going to run this again. It's very, very fast because it's just definitions. It's not actually doing code. So comes the next part, which is to import the data. So I believe the code that you see here is slightly different than the code you will have in your notebook. And it's simply because in order to make the, the things work uh when you copy the data over uh you will um, end up having a copy of in your files sean is that correct that uh, yes that's different? correct and they will see look... a slightly different version of this code but right. basic idea is that we will be importing uh, the training data data is is basically a set of galaxies for which we know both the, the 10 input data vectors and the actual answer. Uh, we've chosen to use three galaxy clusters to do the training, partially to make the data run faster. So the full data set is, I forgot what it is now, it's 40 something. We, the current data set that we could put in is about 70 galaxy clusters, but then the training would take much longer than, than we have available to us. So I'm gonna click on import data and hopefully this will work. I have to permit it to connect to Google Drive. Oh, geez, I have to tell it an account. Hold on, give it, let me give it a second. Okay. Should be running. So for the training uh, data set, most of those functions are, are not you can change the 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 speed of the training by changing some of those coefficients. Is that correct? Uh, which coefficients do you mean? Sorry. In the trainer class, right? You can choose to use something other than the sigmoid. Yes. So right, and uh, changing that function will change how the training proceeds. Yes. So that just changes. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll effectively just change how quickly it trains. And for the network of this size, um, found that the sigmoid uh, trains faster than, say, a ReLU function. Um, but but for those of you who want to mess with the, the code, again, this is one change that probably you don't want to do online now. That is one way you can play with this and change the, the training of the, the set. OK, I believe this is now run. And so now we're going to actually create the neural network object from the, the class. So Tim, do you want to talk about creating the neural network object? Yeah, so the only thing we need to uh, define to create this object is how uh, the size of this network, so we can change how many layers it has and the size of each layer. Um, I found that this combination with three hidden layers, each with six nodes, um, for the only having 10 input data points, um, worked quite well, ran quite quickly, and had good results. But you can feel free to play around with this. Increase, decrease the number of layers, the size of each layer. Um, yeah, I would be curious to see if someone wants to try. I, again, it will it will train a little slower if you put in more layers. Uh, but changing the number of nodes per layer should, should not be a huge penalty. And that's something that uh, would be interesting to see if different people pick different choices here. So again. Editing that is one of the customizability things you can do. I'm going to hit click. I think this is also really fast. Yeah. OK, so having defined all our systems, we haven't actually done any training. This is the part of the, of the, uh, of the workshop that takes the longest. 
when you train the network, you have to tell it how where to train. Oh, Tim, actually, I'm taking over for you. Sorry. Uh, talk about training. Yeah. So um, there's a few things that we can uh, mess around with here. The first is what I've called the scale. So in training the neural network, um, it basically just calculates derivatives um, and then changes the parameters of the network um, by a value given by the derivative of the loss function with respect to each parameter. Um, this scale just changes the size of the change it makes on each step. So a larger scale, it'll make way bigger changes. A smaller scale will make much smaller changes. Um, 0.5 works pretty well um, from what I've noticed. The other thing we can change is uh, the minimum loss. So this is the min underscore loss. This is the uh, um, how small we want the loss function to be before we consider the network to be trained. Um, going any lower than say like 0 0.07, 0 0.06, it probably won't be able to get to that low of a loss function, but um, it can get to 0 0.08 um, relatively consistently. We, yeah, we, we tried to calibrate this so it would take about 10 minutes for the current settings um, so as to not try your patience too much. Um, if you set the min loss much higher, it will train very, very fast, but not very effectively. And so what you will find is that you will run into a few issues um, that will show up if you have no objects in a class. And it turns out, I, I, I tried setting the, the scale, I think Sean, you and I tried it at like 0.5 and basically it didn't find any objects in the distant class. Everything ended up being uncertain. That's right. It didn't train properly. Uh, but I do uh, encourage you to change the min loss and the scale a little bit, again, within factor, again, don't go much lower, but you can go factor two higher and uh, you'll you'll see as you run it different effects. And so one of the nice things about Colab notebooks is you can try. And I believe you will have access to this notebook even after the workshop. Is that correct? You know, frick is, um, yeah. 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 So so I do encourage you to play with things, and particularly if you want to make the min loss point oh six, it will train in much longer than we have time now. Um, and so I won't mess with with this. In fact, I should have pressed this button earlier because we're going to be sitting here for a little while. So actually, this is a great time to ask for questions while we're waiting for the network to train, and while you're waiting for your networks to train. There is a question. Uh, is this scale the same as the learning rate? In the in the meeting chat um so all this scale is is adjusting the size of the changes it makes to the parameters of the network that's all it really does i'm not entirely sure what you mean by learning rate but i don't think so would be my answer it, it does correlate with the actual time rate of learning obviously because yeah. the faster you make changes but it is not linearly correlated because you can get overshoots uh by setting the train the scale too big uh, so setting the scale larger isn't necessarily faster, is my understanding. Yeah, it might be faster initially, but as it tries to refine more and more, as it trains more, it it might take longer at that time. Uh, another thing that um, people can play around with and adjust is this n equals 10. Um, so this is the number of galaxies that at each step it calculates um the what so so you can adjust these parameters differently based on which galaxy is chosen to run the network oh how good is, how well does it do um let's change these parameters uh if you only did that for one galaxy each step and changed after each one um it takes quite a while but let's say oh let's average these changes over what we should change for 10 different objects um and it'll train a lot faster and more consistently. Um, if we made this number way bigger, it would take way too long to train, but if we make it smaller, it would also take too long. So you can mess, long, mess around with that number as well. That's another parameter you can change. And again, I encourage you to experiment. Uh, if you're impatient, you can definitely set, you know, set the min loss to 0.2. I wouldn't set it any higher than that, um, but. Uh, 
Um, there's a question from Anas about would early stop that depends on the change in the loss uh, be effective here? I think one of the issues we'll see when you see the plotting is because you're not testing on every galaxy all the time, your loss actually uh, oscillates up and down. And so the relative loss in a particular step doesn't necessarily need to go down. If you picked a different galaxy to test, the previous step might have made things worse. And you'll see there's, there's a spikiness to the to the loss function. And so the, the, for this particular implementation, it probably would not help. Uh, to address the question in chat about training colors, um, so something interesting about this is we're trying to determine uh, galaxies that are near or far, and you uh, would correct might correctly think that in general far galaxies are uh, less bright than near galaxies, and that's generally true. Um, but this network does not train at all on at, like the actual brightness; it only trains on uh, the colors. So training colors is the difference between um, the bands, um, not the actual band values itself for all the training objects. So that's what gets fed into the trainer um, to train the network on. And this is a particular choice of this, right? You, you can, and in fact, uh, a more complicated version of this would use not just the brightnesses and the colors, but also the sizes of galaxies, because on average, more distant galaxies are bigger, are smaller, um, and it, it, there's this effect of cosmological dimming on the brightness as a function of radius. But uh, again, the more parameters you feed in, the slower it trains. And in an hour and 20 minutes, we chose the simplest set that would give you results that look vaguely good. So last time I tested this, this took 12 minutes. I think there's some variety in the, in the speed of core that Colab gives you. So I don't know. Exactly. Has anyone gotten theirs to finish yet? Um, the, there's a question about was lensing considered at all? No, in this particular case, we didn't uh, didn't change. Unless you had a much faster core than than we do, I guess. Yeah, it, one of the particular aspects. I, this isn't directly part of this. Is that the data set we took this from is a uh, set of nearby clusters that are weakly lensed. So the typical distortions are relatively small on a galaxy per galaxy basis. Uh, and so you, you won't see this on this. On the other hand, when I, at the end of my talk, one of the things I'd like to be able to do is to actually implement a Lensing mass emulator into this, obviously in a more complicated network. And we haven't gotten there yet. Those of you who changed the the stopping uh, uh, would probably get uh, probably finished or change it to have a higher stopping uh, uh, sorry min loss setting. Hopefully, will have finished already. Um, so the question of how to use this with Ruben, uh, it, it, there are lots of active projects. So a lot of the projects I actually mentioned in my talk are based on planning for Rubin data. In this particular case, Rubin has uh, at least three different machine learning algorithms they're testing on for photometric register determination. Um, two of them use the catalog data, and one of them is, is this joint uh, catalog plus image data. And they're still trying to figure out which one will be the default uh, to use in the final data set. Uh, but yeah, it, there are active projects. I am not a member of those projects, so I, I can't tell you exactly what stayed there. And uh, but I've at each collaboration meeting we see graphs showing improvement uh, in in the photometric redshift part. Part of the issue uh, here is that this data set is particularly good for training because we are looking at galaxies that are close by and therefore bright enough for us to know the truth. Uh, even the more distant galaxies are actually bright enough for us to know the truth. In Rubin, one of the big issues in photometric redshift estimation is that 
we typically will not have spectroscopic redshifts for as many or as faint a galaxy as we will be using. And so there are lots sort of lots of data augmentation plans or plans for dedicated observing runs to produce the truth tables that we'll need to, for the training. That's that's actually a, a very hard problem right now. All right. I think I'm still running. Yeah, the training said it, the current plan is to do deep redshift uh, drillings in uh, the deep fields. JWST is potentially a good data set. The field of view is very small, so overcoming what's known as cosmic variance, where the different regions of the sky are different, is going to be a challenge with JWST. It's more likely that uh, a project called SphereX, which is going to make measure redshifts across the sky, is going to be a better training candidate. For us than JWST. SphereX, I think, I don't think it's launched yet, but it's due for the next year. SphereX, it's it's sphere with an X attached. It's a single word. It's a it, it's not a huge telescope. It's like a one and a half meter telescope, but it's dedicated to doing an all-sky spectroscopic survey. All right, I must have gotten a slow core. Unfortunately, right, it doesn't help do me any good to uh, um, to to go back and change the min loss because I lose what's currently running. Yeah, no, no, no stay with it. Um, yeah, top right, you are using a standard core. So it will take longer than thing, but it shouldn't take too much longer. Oh, you're only, you're only is there a way to specify which core to use? I didn't think of it. The top right where it says RAM and disk, you can't, but you you will lose. Uh -huh. I was not clever but, enough to to change uh, that. There are additional questions. Well, uh, it's all, it, when we when you're using the free collab, it's often allocated based on uh, how much other uh, work is taking place. There are other questions in the um, in the media. Yeah, chat. let me talk about the the GMT LT issue is is actually interesting because um, although those are giant telescopes, their fields of view are not gigantic, so the number of objects measured at a time won't be big. The place where neural nets will will show up a lot is in uh, the reconstruction of uh, the integral field spectroscopy units uh, for those telescopes. Integral field spectroscopy is basically packing a bunch of little spectroscopic signals together so that you can get at the same time something that looks like an image, but a three-dimensional image where, where you get the spectrum of each. And interpretation of those will be an interesting things. Um, on the problem of galaxy morphology classifications, those things have been tried, but not by me. Um, and so as I pointed out in my talk, I'm, I'm not really an expert on galaxy morphology classification. Um, the generative architecture stuff has been done to basically construct da training data sets that look like galaxies, where basically you train on the components of galaxies and then you create other galaxies that look like those galaxies to increase, to sort of augment your training sets. That's the, the place where I've seen that used. That's a good question though. Um, yeah, it's definitely on the, on the radar, but not on my project. Um... Those of you who are who have finished the training and have luckily gotten a better, uh, you should look at at least print the visualized training uh, or click on the visualized training. That's a quick uh, measurement. We'll get to that, but start thinking about how you interpret what you've seen because um, again, this is a network that's not given any pre or prior information, and so you normally when you have a a minimization problem. Uh, you make lots of progress at the beginning uh, and then progress it's harder to make. But in a neural network which has not gotten any information before on what the right thing is, 
uh, you'll see that the training proceeds very slowly at first and picks up only at the very end. It's weird. It, this is now considerably slower than any previous run. I, I really. Tim or Sean, do you have a notebook of the same ilk where you happen to have already run this? Uh... This particular training. Yeah, yes, I do. Because we we could just switch over to that if it's still current. Yeah, it's current. I can do that now if you like. Yeah, let me stop sharing and uh, Sean, I'll have you share, and then we can move on to the next steps from here. So I'll stop sharing. Yeah, I I don't know if it has anything to know to do with where I am, but uh, we are unfavored. No, I think it's luck of the draw. Luck of the draw. Just a question of how many TPUs and um, GPUs there are. Okay, can you, you you can see my screen here? Yep. Okay. So here's the, uh, should be the visualization of the training here. Jan, if you want to talk about it. Yeah, you can sort of see, I'll, I'll ask Tim to, to talk about the particulars, but you can see two things going on here. One is this, this aspect that I mentioned before, that the training doesn't know... Uh, where the right direction is, so that instead of having a steep descent at first, it has a very long flatness uh, where it's trying to figure out what the right data vectors to use is. But the second is you can see the spikiness. It has to do with the choice of the number of galaxies, the fact that you're using a different set of galaxies at each trial. And you'll notice that towards the end, it has some very large spikes. Those are galaxies for which it's going to end up being very uncertain on. And they turn out to give you a large loss function. And so just including them randomly will give you those large things. This is why doing a local gradient actually doesn't work for this particular algorithm. Uh, it would work for other algorithms, but it doesn't work for, for this one. And then at the end, it's found the proper our, our get to the loss function. You can see that it's flattening out. It's flattening it out because um, even within the class of objects we have, there are things that have essentially the same colors in this wavelength range, but are right at the boundary between our near and far. And so there are some that have the similar, same colors that are in near and same colors that are in far. One of the things I didn't mention in photometric redshifts is the shape of the spectrum has degeneracies depending on the number of individual colors you have. The more colors you have, the more likely you will not, you'll be able to distinguish the objects. So this particular training uses five different colors. That's why you have 10, like five choose two is 10. Um, uh, but, uh, that's how you get to, uh, to those. But if you had, uh, there are surveys that try to go after, um, you know, uh, try to measure with, uh, 15, I think the, the, uh, the cosmos field survey used 17 filters. There's a plan from a Spanish uh, group to use a, a hundred filter system. Uh, and those will start looking more like photometric redshifts or spectroscopic redshifts. Okay, so so now that we've trained the network, uh, Sean, can you scroll down? Let's look at the data set. So I don't know if you've run those. Let's run those. So one of the interesting things is when we trained, we trained on three clusters, but we're going to apply to two different clusters. The idea is the two galaxy clusters we've started, we've applied this to, are actually somewhat different. One is more similar to the training set. And one actually is a galaxy cluster that I believe is richer, and therefore has a larger distribution of, or less rich, sorry, has a larger distribution of background galaxies. And you can see, we'll see that one of the issues with a neural network is that you want to train on something that looks as representative of the data as possible. So when we train, uh, this network on the full data set, we actually take a much larger number of clusters to train on, which of course takes longer, 
but ensures that you spread the distribution of galaxy properties more evenly and that improves your classification. So if you click on this, does it do anything? I don't remember if this is just a plot or the next one is the one that does. Tim, do you remember? Uh, this one's just a plot. Um, okay, so it's just a plot. So, those images. so it shows you that 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 one is different from the training set. Then, if you test the neural network, now we test it on these galaxy clusters. Uh, it should generate a visualization, uh, which has a different uh, correct and correct values. Uh, so again, we're testing on data where we already have the redshifts, uh, so we know what it's done right with. And you can see that uh, if it's the cluster has a similar distribution of galaxies, it actually does quite well. The things that are nearby are mostly classed right. The things that are far away are mostly classed right. Uh, right, And the things in between are where the uncertain ones. Those are the things that are right at the same distance. If you had a photometric redshift classifier, you'd see the similar things where things at a given redshift, right, the correlation is high at high redshift correlation, low redshift, but there's a scatter. So if you're interested in things that are different in 0.05 in redshift, sometimes you get the answer. Uh, and there's a relatively small fraction of incorrects. Uh, I think it's less than 1% incorrects. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, if you then scroll down to the different data sets, it's not that it does horribly, but you'll notice that the greens migrate in. And because there are fewer background objects to train on, it doesn't know what's a background and what's an object. And it's not so much that it gets the errors, well, it does get more errors, but that it, it becomes less certain because there, too many things are different from the training set. One thing we didn't do, but you actually do have the data sets, I believe, in that folder is you could actually change which cluster you train on and which cluster you evaluate on. And it will be an interesting exercise for you to do after this workshop. Obviously, we're not going to do it now uh, to see how that changes the, the training. But based on, on this classification, we would be able to calculate the population of galaxies in a cluster. Oh, there's a new message. So the data, oh, that's a good point. The data set comes from, uh, we run a, a large imaging survey using the dark energy camera. The dark energy camera is on the four meter telescope in uh, Cerro Tololo in Chile. It was used for the dark energy survey, but it's now available to astronomers everywhere to do the imaging. And we happen to be running an imaging survey of nearby galaxy clusters. So this is our group's data basically, but it is actually, if you're interested, it, it is actually publicly available. So you can go to the, National Optical Infrared Labs uh, website and download all the raw images. It is many, many terabytes, so I'm not sure I'd recommend it, but it's doable. Okay, shall we move to the the next? Uh, let me ask, how are people doing? Is it mostly working for you? Oh, the question about conversions between the actual images and the CSVs. Oh, yes, there's a lot of of, of pre-processing that's done on this on this data. Um, the data is processed actually using the Rubin data pipeline. So it's actually a precursor data to Rubin. It's using the software of Rubin to take the raw images, turn them into combined images, turn them into catalogs of objects. And it's the catalog of objects matched to the spectroscopically known objects that's used in the, in making the CSVs. So the CSVs contain only things for which there are redshifts, except for one, which is where we're going next. So if we go to the last cell in this, um, if you now feed all the objects, including the objects without redshifts, and ask it to classify near and far, um, can you run the code? Has it been run already? I guess it's the same. It has been run. It, has it had been, been, been run, but it's yep. been run exactly the same. Um, you, This is a plot now of the things that are classified as near as a function now of position. The CSV includes position, but wasn't used at all in the training. And you can see that 
a byproduct of galaxy classification is that you can actually find galaxy clusters. Now, in this case, we knew there was a galaxy cluster in the center of the image, but the distribution of near objects is not uniform. And you get this regardless of the fact that you trained on it. So it's a new set of information that the, the training, the, the classification has given you. In this particular case, you find that there's a main cluster component, but you'd also notice that there's a second group of galaxies uh, uh, to the northeast of the cluster that's also at low redshift. Uh, if you if you see at sort of 336 RA 18 DAC. Um, and so you can use these classifiers not just to measure the photometric redshift, but in this particular case, the extra information of getting near to far actually selects out objects that are at similar redshifts and allows you to, to detect galaxy clusters, even without knowing their, their distances exactly. So again, this is a, a place where you could change which cluster you run in. Actually, do we have only A2443 all, Tim? We may have only imported all the data for one cluster. Well, oops. Uh, in principle, if we had the, the other data sets, you would just run on each of them now that you've trained the network and find how many subclumps each cluster is, has what the sub substructure is. So this, this procedure should be able to, to give you more information than what you think you trained on. And this is one of the nice things about classifiers is that, it, as, as I mentioned before, it allows you to find interesting things in your classification and, and select objects under different dimensions. So this was a bit faster than I thought it would be, but also uh, I think a, a useful data set. Are there questions, other things that you'd like to know? I, I encourage you again to play with the training sets. In particular, if you have a little bit of time, play with the uh, the different weights uh, and play with the data sets. So if, you, if you're uh, comfortable in changing the file name paths, uh, it should be able to train on different clusters than it runs on. Um, I can probably load a couple other data sets in. I don't want to load too many in because we're actually writing papers on the, the distribution of them. Uh, but from the individual, this, there's a lot more galaxies than we measure. One of the things I didn't mention in this is that because we only, even in this potential cluster members, we used only the galaxies brighter than 21 and a half. So there's not that many uh, galaxies uh, in the in the samples. Uh, typical, the typical galaxy numbers in, in our final catalogs are about 500,000 galaxies per cluster, behind each cluster. Uh, but of course, most of those are behind the cluster. And so we've already pre-trimmed the data to make things a little bit easier on us. But if you're interested in weak lensing, of course, you need all those 500,000 objects to measure the gravitational lensing signal. So you, you wouldn't be able to get a good lensing measurement just from this set. All right, other questions? If not, I might send people off. Again, you will have access to these notebooks, so play with them, change them there. I, I think Tim has done, a, I think, the, a great job in making it as uh, unblack boxy as possible. Rather than using pre-existing packages, everything is predefined as, as objects, which gives you a sort of complete view into what the program is doing. And that's a, you know, it's not the fastest, but it is the way for you to see what it's actually doing. So thank you, Tim. Okay, yeah, and Tim, Sean, thank you so very much. That was all very clear. Um, very, quick, very quickly, Prashant, you had a question between V2 and V3. I believe the main difference between V2 and V3 is actually in the name referencing. Uh, oh, and the figures. There are some pictures in V3 that are not in V2. Cool. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Sure. All right. Good. Okay. On so, to I, the, sorry, carry on. 
you know, I saying on to the next day, you, there'll be, there's another day of, of interesting talks. And so I'll look forward to, to tomorrow. Yes. So we'll pick up again, uh, 10 o'clock Eastern time, uh, same format. Um, and thank you very much everybody for, uh, um, all of your uh, questions and interactions today. That was extremely uh, instructive. We're making sure that in each of the subsequent modules, we're highlighting different aspects of, uh, you know, machine learning and how to implement it. So, um, you know, if you, if depending on, you'll, you'll be learning something new each time, different, a different style, um, different examples. So um, yes, hope you continue to find it useful. Thank you very much, everybody. And you know, yeah, see you tomorrow.